A number of factors drive circulation of air in the atmosphere. One is that the atmosphere is heated from below. Short wavelength radiation that passes through the atmosphere is absorbed by the ground and then re-radiated into the atmosphere as longer wavelength infrared radiation. Another factor is that more solar energy reaches the Earth at the equator than at either pole. The latitudinal variation in heating combined with heating from below creates conditions for convection cells to form. Excess warming at the ground near the equator creates an area of low pressure and rising air. As this rising air reaches the top of the troposphere, it spreads north and south, cooling as it moves away from the equator. On a non-spinning planet, the air would move all the way to either pole before sinking and returning to the equator, gaining heat as it goes, completing the cycle by rising at the equator again. This would create two large convection cells with a band of low pressure along the equator and regions of high pressure at either pole with regions of converging air near the ground at the equator and at the top of the troposphere over either pole, and regions of divergent air at the top of the troposphere along the equator and near the ground at either pole. Of course, the Earth spins, so these air movements are influenced by the Coriolis effect causing air moving away from the equator to curve to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. This change in direction prevents the convection cells from spanning the entire hemisphere. The convection cells formed by the warming of air at the ground near the equator end at roughly 30 degrees north and south latitude. This convection cell is called the Hadley cell, after George Hadley, an English scientist who proposed some of the mechanisms of atmospheric circulation as we understand them today. There is also a cell formed by the sinking of cool, dense air at either pole. This cell runs to about 60 degrees north and south latitude before Coriolis of deflection and surface warming cause air to rise, completing the cycle. This is called the polar cell. A third cell exists between the Hadley and polar cells. Air movement here is driven by air that falls along the edge of the Hadley cells, but then is pushed along the ground away from the equator, and air that rises at the edge of the polar cells that is then pushed back towards the equator. These are called the Farrell cells after the American meteorologist William Farrell. This model of convection cycles diverted by Coriolis effect does a good job capturing the general characteristics of atmospheric circulation on Earth by explaining the three convection cells on either side of the equator with alternating regions of high and low pressure between them. The direction of airflow along the ground within each cell creates the prevailing winds found at different latitudes. The Hadley cells near the equator move air towards the equator along the ground. Coriolis deflection causes this air to turn to the west. Since winds are described by the direction they come from, these are called the easterly trade winds that run between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude. Surface air moves away from the equator between 30 and 60 degrees latitude, and the deflection of these currents create westerly winds. Between the poles and 60 degrees, surface air moves from the poles and is diverted to the west. The location of these high and low pressure systems and the movement of air between has a major impact on precipitation and evaporation. Within each of these cells, the low pressure regions move warm water containing air up towards the top of the troposphere. As this air moves away from regions of low pressure, it cools and gives up water vapor, which falls as precipitation. At the edge of the convection cells, the now cool dry air falls, creating regions of high pressure. Once it reaches the ground, the cool dry air moves back along the ground, warming and picking up water vapor as it goes. This pattern creates bands of wet and dry climates, with bands of precipitation centered around the convergent zones along the low pressure systems and bands of evaporation centered along the high pressure regions of divergent air. While these large scale circulation patterns do a good job describing general characteristics of global and regional weather conditions, as well as the distribution of wet, dry, warm, and cold climatic regions, the actual climate in specific parts of the globe are determined by interactions of these global patterns with smaller scale regional and local drivers, as well as seasonal variations in the location of maximum solar insulation.